So um, here we are for our first discussion of a uh, topic in, uh, on uh, globalism. Um, today, uh, let's discuss um, uh, globalism and, um, and what the world historians have said about it. Um, so um, I've distributed an outline to you. That's the way things will go in the future. You'll get an outline from me, and uh, then um, these will be talks that will run about an hour or so. And you can uh, follow along in the, uh, in the discussion uh, uh, by means of uh, reference to the, uh, to the outline. And uh, you will be able to keep up with the topics that way. And, uh, and that's, the way, that's the way we'll proceed. So um, let's talk today about globalization and what the world historians uh, of, our, of the era of globalization, let's say the last 40, 50 years, the global historians in that period, what they have said about globalization. Um, so I want to start talking about this in terms of a globalization model, which has become, I guess you'd have to say, the reigning paradigm, the reigning ideology uh, of our, our lifetimes, the last, last 40 years or so. And there is a cartoon that describes uh, uh, its reigning perspectives, which is free trade, free trade all over the world um, uh, through various free trade agreements, the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the World Trade Organization. And uh, this uh, cartoon, of course, uh, criticizes corporate America, says that uh, globalization is a project for the most part that um, benefits corporate America and does not benefit other people uh, in the United States or uh, throughout, throughout the world. So the, um, the whole perspective of globalization is that um, it's run according to free trade and it's a really one, run according to one hegemonic currency, the dollar. So that's the period of the dollar's great uh, strength. We are still in it. It's a, um, it's a hegemony, if you will, of the dollar that was established in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference. We'll talk more about that Bretton Woods Conference in much greater detail as we go along. But um, that's the beginning of the dollar's hegemony. Uh, over the world, and we'll see it in different forms, backed by gold up until 1971, and then after that, not backed by anything. So we don't know what the dollar is worth uh, today, and uh, the dollar nevertheless continues to be the dominant currency, maybe 60 percent, maybe more, of all the transactions in the world are done in dollar, and most dollars, and most importantly, uh, the, uh, the trade in oil uh, is done in dollars. And uh, why that is, is something that we're going to have to ask questions about as, as historians. Uh, but at any rate, this has been called exorbitant privilege from a phrase used by um, um, uh, Charles de Gaulle back in the 1960s, exorbitant privilege that the dollar has um, rather than any other currency um, throughout the world. And it more or less dictates this, um, this regime um, uh, to the world. Uh, so this is the thing that we're going to be discussing, and uh, we want to ask whether this corresponds to what global historians have been telling us. It's a whole picture of world history that leads up to the phenomenon of globalism, whether they can say that globalism is something that we've always been creating, there, or another way of putting this in terms of cycles is to say that uh, it's a recurring thought, that there have been prior globalizations. So that would be a sort of a Spenglerian uh, approach to this thing to say that globalizations rise and fall um, in, uh, in history. It's a cyclical way of looking at it rather than saying that all of history has been um, uh, directed, has been one unaltered linear ascent uh, to this uh, uh, time of globalization. Um, so um, in the 1990s, um, um, uh, uh, Samuel Huntington, um, 1994, offered an argument uh, about the conflict of civilizations, clash of civilizations, he called it. And he said there wasn't one world at all. Another alternative paradigm. He said the world continues to be fractious and difficult. And it's difficult, um, or I should say the contentions in the world, are, are according to civilizational ideas. Um, whole regions that imagine themselves to be one and under one civilization. The conflicts of the future, Huntington said, would be along the lines of these of these civilizations. This is an alternative conception to the notion of one world, one globalism, uh, that was offered in 1994. So you can see the regions. There's Western civilization. So we see it here in blue. It's the all the Atlantic countries. And then he says there's a kind of a Latin civilization. It's interesting that there's a civilizational uh, boundary 
um, between the United States and Mexico, according to Huntington. It's a weird idea, if you ask me. Um, and uh, similarly, a civilizational barrier between Western civilization, here in blue, and um, what he calls an orthodox civilization. So you're going according to religion here. So we have Latin Christendom, in effect, in blue. And then we have the um, an orthodox religion um, in, um, in light blue. And um, there are conflicts along the lines uh, between those two. And uh, presumably NATO is now organized to line up according to that civilizational uh, cleavage, according to according to Huntington once again. So the struggle in the Balkans, he said, was a struggle between orthodoxy on one side and Latin Christendom on the other. You know, the struggle that divided up Yugoslavia in the 1990s. It's another weird idea, if you ask me, but this has been tossed out and a lot of people go for it in a big way. And among the people who go for it are the people who say that Islam represents a whole civilizational outlook and in the future there will be a um, civilizational conflict between Islam and uh, the West, presumably, or Islam in Russia, or Islam in, who knows, somebody else maybe, uh, Islam in India, owing to the you know considerable tension between Muslims and Hindus in, in India. So that's Huntington's idea about that. And then he says there's a um, sub-Saharan African civilization, he says, that which will also have this same quality. It'll be conflicting with uh, the um, Islamic civilization along a certain border. He says the uh, Islamic civilization is unique because it has bloody borders, bloody borders. So of course he's thinking about Israel because Israel, you can hardly see it here, but it's in blue. It's with the West along with Australia, New Zealand, etc. cetera. Um, and um, it's, there, there are bloody borders, he says, with Islam, Islam vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis India, and uh, indeed, vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And then there's a Sinic civilization, he says, and, and a few more other lesser uh, contenders might be, uh, might be conceptualized. So you know, that's an alternative to the notion of globalism that has been kicking around. You can see that it's popular with those who see the struggles in the Mideast between um, Israel and the other um, Mideastern countries, um, who see those as the primary conflicts in, in world politics. Now, the way it was taught to me, um, world history was centered pretty much on the, on the West. So the West is the thing. Um, and I, um, you could say, uh, you could look back on it. Now, nowadays, this is, by the way, it's considered quite passe. Uh, but you could um, look back on it uh, nowadays and say maybe it was a racist perspective. We only were only, only thought white people were worth worthy of consideration, and others were not. And, uh, you know, so that idea uh, more or less um, continues to be uh, uh, suggested to us, and you know we can continue to kick that idea around. I'm not sure how far to run with that and a purely racial interpretation of. Uh, the interpretation of world history, you know, in my lifetime. A lot of people do make this argument, this Frankopan movie about Silk Road that I'm asking you to uh, look at. It, uh, it goes a long way in the direction of arguing that way, uh, but I think it goes too far. And, and I'll be interested to know your, your views on the matter, whether we, whether we go, don't go too far with a racial interpretation of history. But at any rate, um, the Frankopan movie is certainly right in some respects. And, um, Frank Upon talks about his youth, and he says uh, he was taught that Europe was the only thing worth considering, in England, indeed. But, of course, he was educated in England, so uh, what, what, what would you expect? Same way uh, with, with me, uh, educated in the United States. When I first began to become exposed to um, history, uh, and even in college, um, it was taught pretty much that um, Western civilization was the most powerful civilization, and really the one that you had to consider first in talking about the whole world. Uh, well, you know, something to that. The, the world was um, um, a colonial world for the most part. European powers owned most of the world, and uh, the colonial powers were rising up um, in struggle against their um, overlords and trying to get their independence. They, of course, got it in the course of my lifetime. Um, so you can see where this um, perspective about Western civilization vis-a-vis -vis the others, uh, this kind of, um, how to put it, traditional mastery of Western civilization of the rest of the world, you can see why this issue would come up. Um, and of course, um, 
whatever color is, coloration you put on the whole uh, discussion of the matter. Uh, but um, when we taught history, we said uh, civilizations began pretty much in the Middle East. So why do we say that? Uh, Bill, there were four places where civilizations are first recorded by historians. They're in river valleys, and of course, they're the famous ones. You know the uh, Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent, which they teach you about in Western civilization. And of course, the Nile Valley, you know, the second or third week of a civilization, Western civilization course, we would get at least a week talking about Egypt. Uh, you know, what we said about it was could only be very, very sketchy. But at any rate, we recognized that Egypt was of interest to us as Westerners, and that it was the viewpoint, as Westerners, um, it was of interest. But these two areas, the uh, Mesopotamia and the Nile Valley, those were the uh, origins that we were most interested in. But there are other origins, of course, there's in the Indus Valley at just about the same time. Um, we get the same kind of development of civilizations, that is to say cities, um, agriculture, uh, developing and then cities developing from this agriculture, agriculture, and this is all put back in the fourth century or so before uh, Christ, uh, before the Christian era. Um, and similarly, they said, "Oh, uh, in the river valleys in China as well." Uh, we have to note from various evidences, archaeological and otherwise, so that uh, there's uh, civilizational development in China as well. Oh, from then on, the course. Uh, follows pretty much the career of these two civilizations in the West. And uh, you don't hear anything at all, nothing about the Indian civilization or the, Chi or the Chinese from this point on. Well, it's a course in West Western civilization, uh, to be sure. Well, anyhow, uh, they were telling us that there are no roots in India or China of our civilization. It has no roots there. Well, okay. That's, that was the beginning of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the discussion of Western civilization. Excuse me, I'm going the wrong way. And uh, then the argument was made that Western civilization pretty much comes out of the Eastern Mediterranean, and it comes through the Greeks, and then the Greeks become very important to us. Of course, the Eastern Mediterranean is important to us because of the Christian background. And of course, the Jews are very important because of Christianity. And so that we develop in Western civilization a, a concept of Judeo-Christian civilization. That's an interesting notion that could be uh, discussed and debated at some length, whether um, uh, this concept is something that emerges spontaneously out of the historical material, or whether it's something we've imposed on it pretty much because we want the Christians and the um, Israelites to be thought of as part of the same community. Maybe we impose that on the topic. I don't know. These are large questions that can be debated among world historians. But in a course on Western civilization, we said that civilization pretty much begins here. And so after talking about Mesopotamia and the Greeks and various other Eastern European civilizations, we start talking, talking, we start talking about the Phoenicians and their control of Carthage. And pretty soon we're talking about Greece and then the Greek city-states, and then we're up pretty much into the period of about five centuries before the Christian era, and we're talking about the Greek city-states and their colonies all around the Mediterranean, and then the Greek city-states give way to Macedon, and uh, Philip of Macedon, and then his son Alexander, uh, they take this Greek civilization, although it's no longer the Greek city-states we're talking about, it's, it's a big territorial state called Macedon, and we're going to take them into the east, and they have a conflict with Persia, and overcome Persia. So right from the beginning is this conception that Western civilization and Western ideas, uh, they're at war with Eastern ideas. And Eastern ideas, pretty much it's Persia we're talking about, Iran. Um, so um, the conflict with Persia pretty much forms the character, if you will, of the Hellenistic uh, civilization. And then, of course, the, the Romans inherit the culture of the Hellenistic civiliz civilization. And then you have a large Roman Empire, which includes uh, the whole Mediterranean, and of course, which includes the backward characters in Western Europe, <laughs> very backward, backward states, very primitive uh, states, you know, people drinking mead out of their skulls 
the enemies of their skulls, you know, the skulls of their enemies. Um, and then you have um, uh, the Roman conquest of Britain and all that. So the British, uh, now British historians, of course, are very much interested in this Roman conquest because that's how they get Western civilization. So they uh, devoted a lot of attention to that in the schools. And uh, we do, we do too. Um, and we're very much interested in all this stuff, but um, we start making a lot of pretensions about some of the inherent interesting qualities of these barbarians. I mean, you're we're certainly not talking about barbarians anywhere else in the world and saying they're interesting, uh, but the barbarians in the West, these Germanic tribes, you know, as Tacitus uh, tells us uh, uh, in his uh, uh, Latin discussion, his Roman discussion of the, of the German tribes, you know, they have a certain democracy and the blah, blah, blah. And then we get to talking about things like that. And all of this intended to point toward our institutions, the institutions of the 20th, now the 21st century, all supposed to point toward these institutions and coming maybe at least to some certain degree out of the German forest or something like that. We're not interested in anybody else's forest. Uh, we're not interested in, uh, uh, you know, civilizations that are this primitive, uh, or at any rate that are, how to put it, pre-urban. Um, uh, pre um, we're not um, interested so much in the other civilizations as we are in these. And, and so in Western civilization starts to get this narrow, narrow focus. And then, of course, it continues in that vein until we say the Western civilization, by means of its oceanic exploration, becomes more than a Mediterranean civilization, but it becomes a world civilization. So, so the Europeans discover the world. Nowadays, we hate this talk. Europeans discover the world. We say, how could a person be discovered, uh, you know, uh, if, if they already were there? Well, they know they're there. Um, they don't need some outsider to come and discover them. Uh, I'm a, I've thought this was kind of a moot point, and I'm, I don't know how far it's, it's useful for us to argue about these things. Anyhow, we have to register them and talk about them to some degree, I suppose. Um, at least in, in any kind of course that pretends to talking about global questions, especially matters relating to ideology. I suppose we have to take up questions like this. Um, but of course, the, the reference in Western civilization is not that these places, you know, uh, didn't know they existed <laughs> before the explorers got to them. It's just that uh, the, the Europeans found out about them before they found out about the Europeans. So that's an interesting point. It was the Europeans who made the contact. Ah, so this raises the question for me, the geopolitician, uh, the person who's interested in this whole matter in terms of power, uh, not just in terms of cultural questions about which you can get, you know, hot under the collar and, and, and you know, have, you know, fascinating cultural disputes, rename schools and do all sorts of things like that. Um, but I'm also interested in the, the questions that a historian would be interested in. Why exactly do these things happen? Who had the power to do things and who did it to whom, as the Russians like to say. Russians say this wonderful question is, they say, who and whom? Who is the um, subject of the action? And who is the object? So that's where the Western civilization history uh, comes in. I suppose the Western civilization is saying not only uh, that its culture is interesting to Westerners, but also its culture is better than everybody else's because it's the one that conquers. Huh. The Western cultural superiority is the secret to Western dominance. Western civilization seems to be arguing. Well, okay, so you can see there are all sorts of problematic uh, questions here, uh, questions about hurt feelings, cultural questions, a lot of questions uh, that are related to these things. And uh, this is the perspective that History pretty much starts with this notion of Western civilization in the 19th and the 20th centuries. And it gets another dimension at the turn of the century with the development of what might be called geopolitics. Um, people start to look at it in terms of power. Um, so I'm very much interested in geopolitics because uh, this is the way I like to look at it too. So I want to know what some of these early theorists about the relationship of geography to uh, history, um, what some of these people say. And the great figure in geopolitics is Sir Halford McKinder. Uh, his book, uh, uh, or excuse me, his article, the, uh, uh, the 
geographical pivot of history, written in 1904, um, is a big, big influence and really in a, puts the study of geopolitics on the map. Although there are other geopoliticians, uh, there are Swedes and Germans in the 19th century, and they're going to be Germans uh, under Hitler. Karl Haushofer is going to be advising Hitler and teaching him uh, what the Germans call geopolitik. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of interest in geopolitics. And even nowadays, geopolitics is a term that is normally used. If you read the business papers, they're always talking about, uh, you know, things that are going on in the market, but then they always say, oh, and there's also geopolitics. Geopolitics, you know, there could be a war or some other thing that has nothing to do with the market uh, that could affect business, they're always saying. So geopolitics is on their mind, and geopolitics comes up, I guess, in an academic way. Maybe Henry Kissinger, uh, in my lifetime, Henry Kissinger did the most to popularize the term in the normal, widely distributed pundit press that you that you come across. Anyhow, McKinder's the main figure, the earliest figure um, that popularizes this idea. And this is his main idea, uh, that um, uh, the whole thing in, in, um, in world history is the world island. Okay, that's a big one right there, the world island. So never mind talking about Africa or the Americas or any of that in history. Uh, the thing we have to really talk about is the Eurasian landmass. A world island. As you see in the world island, uh, Europe is a little cape. The French poet Paul Valéry says, ce petit cap, this little, little cape on the edge of the world island and it comes to dominate the world. And, and of course, he was, um, I thought this quite, uh, quite wondrous. Um, anyhow, um, what McKinder is saying here is that um, uh, the center of everything is this world island and the center of the world island is the heartland. So uh, in this famous pronouncement, who controls the, the heartland controls the world island, who controls the world island controls the world. Hmm. Interesting thought. I don't know if I would have uh, expected an idea like that uh, in view of the previous history we've been talk talking about, which seems to emphasize the sea does it not? So it isn't a question of conquest of the world island, but getting across the Atlantic and getting control of uh, the Americas. That seems to be the secret to this world commerce that gets set up um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, and really in the 18th. You know, it's not something that ex existed right away in the 16th century, but it, what starts to look like a world system, or at any rate, can be called a world system. We'll talk very soon about people who actually do like to call it a world system, the world, a world systems theorists, Emmanuel Wallerstein and, and his cohort. Um, but anyhow, this is the argument. It's the heartland is the key there. That would say, seem to say Russia. Russ, who, uh, let's see, what, let's repeat the formula. Who controls Russia controls the world island. What kind of history is that? Who controls Russia? Control? No, no. It's uh, not so much a question of uh, Russia, but a question of control of the world island um, through the, um, the area of the prairie across. We'll talk about the prairie in just a minute, but let me um, finish with this world island idea. He says that um, maybe, or I, sh I should say it's implicit in the thinking of Mackinder that and maybe it's important um, to contain uh, the expansion of the heartland to the extremities, to the rimlands of the world island, and that maybe a lot depends on that. Now, we stop for a second. We're talking about the European imperialists. They are the ones in the 16th, 17th century who might be said to be containing the expansion of the heartland, if there is such a thing. By the way, I don't even think there is really such a thing. I don't think there was any heartland expansion to the rimlands of the world island. Um, but, you know, Mackinder is a British writer, and he's talking in the heyday of British imperialism, 1900, the British, British Empire is still very, very important. Very, not only important, but it's increasingly using troops uh, to control its colonies all over the world. It's engaging in a scramble for Africa and it's using hundreds of thousands of troops um, uh, in this endeavor. 
And so it's a very, very ambitious, aggressive force uh, in world politics. You could say the most ambitious force in world politics in 1900. So that's about when he's writing. So what's he talking about here? I guess he's talking about the British Empire. The British Empire and its various posts in India, defending the Trucial Emirates in the uh, Persian Gulf, um, uh, with an implantation in Egypt and various places in the Middle East, uh, with interests in the Far East, with uh, treaty ports and all sorts of other contacts in the Far East, uh, that it, uh, in effect, represents the defender of the rimlands against the expansion of the heartland to the extremities of the world island. So it is preserving the world's freedom, this British Empire, in these holdings all around the peripheries, all around the periphery of the world island. It is, in a certain sense, holding a certain rampart for freedom. No, not only for all the lands that it conquers, but also for Europe itself. It's uh, keeping this the Russians from expanding into to Europe, I guess you'd have to surmise. So anyhow, this whole fundamental conception of geopolitics, very, very powerful thought for uh, people who think about British imperialism, for officials and for uh, military people, and diplomats, and people like that. Um, okay, so that was a British perspective uh, that really um, had a certain spellbinding effect on um, an elite community, you could say, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. Uh, and then we went right into World War I, and there's an enormous disillusionment with World War I, and uh, the British and its allies, they end up on the winning side, of World War I, the Germans who challenged the British end up on the losing side. So Oswald Spangler for the writing as a German in 1918 uh, decided to write a world history uh, which would stress the idea of the decline of civilization. And they always uh, distinguish between civilization and culture, culture. Um, that uh, civilization is represented most by England was actually in the process, a long run process of decline. And he said this happened all the time. Uh, cycles uh, were uh, in evidence when we talked about these things, you know, empires rose and fell. Oh, he did these huge lists of empires. So I hate this way of looking at things myself, you know, big lists of recurrent things that keep coming up in history and, and you're looking for repetitions. Gee, I don't think that gets us anywhere. I want to go from the beginning of history to the present, see if we can determine some line of development, rather than saying it all keeps recurring over and over again, opens the door to saying, you know, twas ever thus. And, and that is what he said. You know, he said that uh, just as the other empires have declined, Western civilization, he said, uh, will also decline. What he meant by that was Western uh, in the sense of British and uh, really Western European, uh, uh, as, a, as a, a non-German um, civilization. Although Germans were part of Western civilization for Spengler, but um, uh, the British um, Empire uh, was going to decline. And he said the country of the future, of all things, was going to be Russia. A lot of people don't pay my, who like to quote Spengler and talk about Spengler, um, I don't say much about that, uh, but that's a very, very important thing in his thought that uh, Russia was going to be the country of the future. He said Russia by 100 years from now, so what is this, 1918, he's talking about our time. Uh, in fact, he's talking about right now. Um, by this time, he said, um, um, Russia would have emerged as the great force in world history. I guess uh, if you put it in um, um, uh, terms of geopolitics, uh, the great force on the world island Russia would pretty much dominate, pretty much dominate the world. But he said that there would be an interim period, a, a, a gap between uh, 1918 and uh, 2018. He said there'd be a gap in there in which the Germans could play a huge role. So you can imagine how a person like Hitler would have greeted this idea. I mean, I brought those two fellows and actually met Hitler and Spengler. <laughs> they actually met and they didn't get along. 
not easy to figure out why. It's a kind of a mystery, in my opinion, uh, because it seems to me this is a natural um, thought uh, for Hitler to have about Spengler, and Spengler should have loved Hitler, especially since he had this idea about Prussian socialism, that there should be a kind of a national and socialism should not be an international idea, as communists said, but it should be a national idea, and that's, you know, that's Hitler, national socialism. So, you know, it seemed to me it was, should be a natural, should have been a natural for those two to have be developed a fast friendship, but they fell out. Well, I guess there are lots of reasons for things like uh, things like that. Anyhow, this uh, kind of perspective, kind of, uh, kind of interesting and kind of very influential through the 20s and the 30s, um, Arnold Toynbee in his multi-volume history of the West kind of popularized world history for most people. I think you could probably in the 50s and 60s, 70s, you could probably have seen copies of these in nearly every middle class home, uh, copies of uh, Toynbee's works. If anybody read any history or like to pretend they read any history, like to put some books on the coffee table to pretend they read some history, uh, they probably like to pretend they've at least taken a look at Arnold Toynbee's works. And Toynbee's very Spenglerian and uh, very, very, very much cyclical. And all, although he has the West surviving where uh, Spengler has it declining and going under, um, the plowing under, uh, the, pl the real title, uh, the German title translates best as the plowing under of the sunset lands. Um, so um, so that, that idea uh, does not come across in, uh, in uh, Toynbee, of course, and, and uh, Toynbee gives, a, gives it a little brighter, a brighter uh, turn, a little a brighter finish than Spengler, but the method is very much the same, and Toynbee admitted this. Uh, uh, historian who worked with Toynbee was J.H. McNeil, so he was a powerful influence, I think, on the world history of the Cold War. And um, like the people before him, the general geopolitical atmosphere um, colored to a considerable degree. Well, let me find a better way of putting that. Why don't I say his geopolitical views cohered? That'd be maybe a better way to put it. They cohered with the general uh, worldview, the general perspectives. Um, of the United States in the Cold War, defending presumably Western civilization against Eastern challenges. Uh, these ideas uh, cohered, cohered, and provided a certain, how to put it, encouragement, backing, spiritual uh, sustenance, support um, uh, for the case of the West against the Soviets, against the Russians, against the Chinese, against the East in the uh, Cold War. Although, you know, he doesn't preach a, this anti-Eastern perspective and he's not very strident about the Cold War. His stuff was very, very dense and sophisticated and, um, you know, well-crafted stuff, still very much respected by world historians who nevertheless um, have a bone to pick with him and have criticized him very sharply for his notion uh, that um, uh, the West um, diffuses uh, Western culture diffuses to other places. That we talk about the spread of civilization, it's the diffusion from a certain center uh, out to the rest of the world. So it's diffusion from the West out to the world that creates globalism, you might surmise from this argumentation. Anyhow, he did his dissertation on uh, the step. So I have that uh, word on your outline there, the step uh, under McNeil. We talked about the closure of the Eure Eurasian ecumene. So ecumene means uh, known world. So closure of the Eurasian ecumene. So here we're talking about Mackinder's heartland again. And uh, we're talking about this region in here. <laughs> and I guess maybe you could say this is the heartland or something, but McNeil was interested in the step. And he said there were these civilizations here and they one after another across the heartland. Of course, they're not, wait a minute, they're not civilizations, they're tribes. I used the wrong word there. These are the number of these tribes. And uh, he said they were sort of in control of various pasture lands. He said, but when something went sour in one pasture land, um, there would cause, there'd be a war, of course, between the tribes. And then 
things would go sour in the next pasture land as, as they had to move over. And um, yeah, there was a phenomenon of these tribes falling, rising and falling like dominoes. In fact, he gave a, um, a, um, a, an illustration in his book of a, what looked like a stack of dominoes, uh, uh, all the tribes uh, across the ship, uh, because of course they live on these grasslands, they have herds. And uh, as herdsmen, they, um, uh, they have to make war if, if, um, if their pasture land um, and it becomes unproductive. They have to find new pasture land and they, they impinge on each other. So naturally there, there has to be war across the steppe. So he thought this was a fascinating thing and um, a great history uh, that was not appreciated, perfectly right there, that the great history that was not appreciated in the previous world histories. And maybe he thought the steppe was a fabulous factor in world history. And it especially relates this notion of the central quality of these grasslands. Um, by the way, I should also say that um, you could generalize, although this is a very, very broad generalization, but who, who cares? We're here, we're talking about world historians, so we can't general, generalize, we're lost. Uh, but you could say that um, these grasslands have, uh, in the north, they have a kind of a, what the Russians call a taiga, that is a big forest belt. And then there's a uh, tundra, uh, that is a um, area that's permanently frozen, frozen over and can't do much, can't do much there. And then in the south, uh, same token, you have uh, uh, deserts at the bottom of the step. So the step is the place that really counts from the standpoint of um, uh, climate conditions and all the rest of that for the development of civilizations. And um, um, the next thing for him to say is that the Western civilization was at war to try to close this ecumene. So Alexander did it when he conquered the uh, Indus Valley civilization, at least uh, got troops through it uh, for a while. Uh, so Alexander is closing, closing the ecumene. That's one of the first closures of the ecumene. And then there's going to be another closure of the ecumene. And of course, the Russians are going to close it in the 17th century when the Russians uh, expand and, and absorb all of Siberia, which they have, which they have today. Western civilization, therefore, develops in, a, in terms of a dialectic uh, with the East, once again, with the advent of these Western uh, barbarians, I guess you could say. Um, and um, and uh, at any rate, that is, um, uh, that's the, the, the background for the development of, of, uh, of the West. Now, as you look through this book, and uh, is there anything about China? Is there anything about India? in this uh, rise of the West? Well, yes, yes. He eventually finds a way uh, to give us some chapters on China at some point. Does not deal with India much. Um, deals with the Middle East pretty well, but it's in terms of the conflict and the cultural um, contention dialectic uh, with, the, uh, with the West. Um, so in a way, he had broadened the discussion, but um, not as much as perhaps it could be. And uh, he had given great offense uh, to a lot of his readers um, who were uh, very much uh, an antipathetic, you could say, hostile to imperialism, to Western imperialism. Remember, this is during the period of the Cold War, the last half of the 20th century. Um, a lot of people took the view, a lot of historians, and I'll talk more about this as we go along, uh, that a lot of this was very imperialistic uh, to be so concentrated about the West. And maybe world history wasn't so centered on the West as we'll be getting to this thought um, um, as we proceed. Um, anyhow, uh, this argument raises the whole question of the contacts across this Eurasian landmass and the whole question of the Silk Road, presumably uh, area where um, uh, uh, all sorts of um, uh, sophisticated Eastern products are traded uh, with the West. The West has practically nothing to give for them. Eventually, the West is going to get into uh, the Americas and get and get uh, precious metals, so silver and gold. And this, these precious metals are going to be traded for these sophisticated products. That right away tells you the West is very backward, except for it's lucky to have gold, lucky to have this metal. Um, 
and that uh, the East is very, very advanced, very sophisticated because its products are, are the ones that are desired. The Easterners are not crying out for mice in China or things like that. Uh, it's the Westerners who are interested in the porcelains and silks of the East uh, and etc. So um, Marco Polo's trip uh, is, is cited, you know, so here we have Marco Polo, 13th century, making the trip to the East um, to make contact with the Mongols. So the Mongols are running China by this time. And we'll talk more about the Mongols in a minute. But any, anyhow, the West is a primitive civilization, um, in effect, uh, adventurous to be sure, but um, um, not very sophisticated. And it's trying to make contact with the most sophisticated part of the world uh, in, the, in the East, uh, in, this in the 14th century. That's the imagery at any rate. And um, the 14th and um, part of the 15th centuries, they pretty much belong to the Mongols, the greatest of the steppe tribes. Remember we talked about this fighting that goes across, that McNeil talks about across the steppe. Uh, we get finally a confederation of tribes in the East, Turkic tribes, often you, they, people say Turkic and Mongol, Turco-Mongol, um, uh, to describe this confederation led by the Mongols and led by people we've heard of in our literature. We have amusing songs about them as well, Genghis Khan and people of that sort. And by the way, the Mongolians, by the way, have re-erected statues to Genghis Khan and now have raised him up as a great, a great hero, greater than Lenin uh, for them. Um, so um, at any rate, um, this um, uh, development of the Mongols, this begins in the uh, in the, in the 13th, um, and then finally in the 14th century, uh, and then it will last into the 15th. And eventually the Mongols are going to have an empire, as you can see from this map, uh, they're going to have a, an empire that stretches from Vienna, uh, or excuse me, from Beijing in the east. They're going to conquer China. So that, that's conquering the, probably the most sophisticated um, civilization in the world, conquering China, and the running China for a good while, uh, and then going to expand by means of war. They're going to conquer Baghdad, and uh, they're going to uh, get control, essentially, of all that area that Persia once controlled as a center of world politics, and they're going to go all the way to Vienna. Uh, and um, the Europeans had everything they could, uh, everything they could handle in the Mongol armies. And uh, at any rate, they turned them back at Vienna. John Sobieski, as you probably know, the Polish soldier, led troops against, uh, against the Mongols and stopped them at Vienna, something of which the Poles are proud. Um, but the, the Mongols represented kind of a unification of the world island. I mean, in, in the terms that are suggested by, um, by geopolitics, uh, by Mackinder and his uh, in his perspectives, uh, the Mongols really uh, they're in a position to run the world, uh, or at any rate to appear to appear to do so. Uh, and then of course um, there is this question of the Silk Road. There's there is a is an economic connection uh, among all these market towns. Um, there is an, uh, that run across the world island and run pretty much along the same route that the Mongols take, uh, that even exists today. And that is the part of the Chinese plans and plans of others um, to try and unite the whole Eurasian subcontinent uh, along this Silk Road. And that's the title of the book of Francopan that I'm having you consider. You're not reading this book, but you're going to hear Francopan describing his work and, and um, elaborating on his ideas. Um, so maybe this is the center of world history. At least Frankopan thinks so. Um, maybe this is the center of world of world history. Well, anyhow, that was a perspective that was kicked around in the um, in the sixties and in the seventies. Uh, McNeil's rise of the West very much concerned with those things, uh, the, the central role of the step and the diffusion diffusion of civilization. So um, this is a perspective that uh, coheres uh, with the position of the NATO-led West in the Cold War against the East, against the Eastern Bloc, Sino-Soviet Communist Bloc, uh, 
um, it coheres nicely. Um, not to call, um, um, not to call um, McNeil nothing but a cold warrior. I don't. A lot of people that did say that, but um, I don't know if I would take it so far to denounce his work and denounce him um, in those in those terms. Uh, but there was a certain question of this diffusion idea um, that's going to grate on world historians, as, I, as we'll be as we'll be raising that question in a minute or two. Um, but um, uh, before we do that, uh, let's talk about uh, Lefton Stavrianos, a Greek scholar uh, who taught in the United States for the most part uh, and who published a number of works, fascinating stuff, brilliant world history um, that um, actually cut out on a new path. <clears throat> tried to make the argument that the Western civilization, in effect, um, had uh, played a role in underdeveloping the East. Now, there is a, a perspective on the relationship between East and West uh, that was never contemplated um, in the earlier um, discussions of Western civilization, European disp uh, expansion, or European uh, diffusion. Uh, this is the idea that in reaching out from the West, um, the European civilizations subjected the other lands to a division of labor, uh, which was to the disadvantage of the conquered peoples and which made them less advanced. So if underdevelopment uh, was something that uh, had to be explained uh, during the time Stavrianos wrote, uh, the last half of the 20th century, the 70s and 80s, um, if underdevelopment had to be explained, it had to be uh, explained as something imposed upon the, uh, the rest of the world by the West. Hmm. So the West is the, the, West is the uh, creator of the underdevelopment of the world, according to his view. So his famous book, although there are a number of really good books, um, but his most uh, famous world history, and the one that was used as a text often, and of course, in fact, he did uh, uh, follow it with a text, as did McNeil, a, a regular text that could be used in high schools. Um, but um, the book in which this argumentation is laid out is, uh, is called uh, Global Rift. And um, the date for Global Rift is 1981. So subtitle, as the third world comes of age, but in effect, the, it, the title could have been How the West Underdeveloped the Third World. So that's pretty much the argumentation. So what's he talking about there? He's talking about the, um, uh, the trade patterns. Now, here is the trade pattern, the famous triangular trade that is described in world, world systems theory by Emmanuel Wallerstein, Giovanni Arrighi, um, Samir Amin, Andre Gunderfrank, and all sorts of other people who have made this argument. And um, you know, one has um, this this idea appears in a lot of in a lot of places. This triangular trade. Well, let's describe it first, and then uh, complete the sentence. Uh, this triangular trade that's set up pretty much in the 17th and 18th centuries involves um, um, a um, how shall we put it? It has to. Um, it has to set up an economy and it starts to develop a world economy around the Atlantic based on slavery. So the European slavers uh, take slaves from some from Africa. Uh, they take them across the Atlantic and uh, deliver them uh, to the Caribbean and to, and to the southern United States and to Brazil and uh, and well, there's a whole area in the new world. They develop, they bring the slaves and then they bring back raw materials, um, um, tobacco, cotton, rum, um, coffee, sugar, mainly sugar. Sugar is a big thing in the um, Eastern, Medi uh, excuse me, in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, well, they bring these things back to Europe and the Europeans sell various kinds of manufactured goods, pots and pans, guns mainly, uh, and the rest of that to Africa and then take some more slaves. And so the, this is the famous triangular trade. They say the world economy, so the so they argue, the world economy of the 16th, no, the 17th and 18th centuries um, is pretty much built around 
of this triangular trade. Well, Sabriano says, well, uh, there's more to the triangular trade. Um, there's a Baltic uh, wing, and there's Baltic a trade that goes up there. And, um, and similarly, there's a Mediterranean leg on the thing. And um, so they are connecting um, all of these societies. And they're really introducing through this trade, he says, the, the, the Westerners are introducing through this trade uh, serfdom in Russia. There's something to that. Um, the first contacts with the Russians, the English made contact with them in the 16th century. And uh, they start doing trade for um, uh, grain and timber. The Europeans have pretty much done away with all their timber um, by this time. The, you know, Western Europe, I should say, Western coast uh, still needs timber to be able to build. And they're getting it from the forests in the east. And they pretty much need grain, too. So they get more grain from there. And so they get all these things through the Baltic trade. And the, the uh, people in the Baltic, mainly Poland and Russia, developing Polish and Russian crowns, uh, with the big, huge expanses of land, uh, they eventually impose serfdom on their peasants, the second serfdom, they call this. First serfdom is in the West prior to 1500. Second serfdom after that, during this relatively late period, um, uh, from 1649 in Russia up until 1861, this second serfdom. Uh, and you, you have a lot of serfdom throughout uh, Eastern Europe. Polish serfdom as well, and, and German, and a lot of, a lot, still a lot of serfdom, where it's pretty much gone out of existence uh, by the 16th century in the West. Um, that this is all imposed on them, says Lavrianos, um, by the demands of this world system, by this international division of labor. So the West imposes this backwardness, so to speak, or at any rate, this backwardness in terms of social relations, uh, if you consider serfs backward. And, in the same way that you might consider slavery to be kind of a backward uh, scheme. At any rate, let's not worry about backward. Let's just call them serfdom and slavery. They are somewhat comparable, and they do come up about the same time. And this is more or less the argument uh, that you find in Stavrianus. Very interesting, interesting kind of argument, in my opinion. Uh, very much worthwhile. Um, very good background. Very educational stuff. Uh, gives you terrific uh, perspectives. Europe, he said, creates um, creates the third world. Well, I've mentioned um, uh, this uh, triangular trade and these uh, and these uh, world systems uh, theorists, and um, and um, they represent uh, the influence, I guess you could say, of um, Cold War Marxism on this. Now, as I say, Marxism, which is not communism uh, uh, of the Soviets or the Chinese variety during the Cold War, uh, but it's Westerners who are Marxists and use Marxist approach approaches to understanding history. And they analyze these um, uh, these um, theorists of uh, world systems theory, the Wallersteins and the others. Um, they analyze this Atlantic core of uh, the world economic system, a kind of globalization, you could say. They analyze this in terms of uh, Marxism. At any rate, they think they are. They think they call it a Marx Marxist approach, and uh, they they, uh, they reference Marx. Um, Marx didn't exactly write about these things to the degree that would have been helpful to them, but they go ahead anyhow and uh, analyze these things in terms of class and economics and all the rest of that. Um, <coughs> and in terms of the notion of uh, third world dependency, not a good thing, third world dependency. So it's, it is this idea of uh, advancing backwardness into the world, Western civilization advancing backwardness into the world that emerges with them from their perspectives. And once again, this comes out of the critique of imperialism. So if you said that McNeil and his notions of the rise of the West cohered with the typical Western attitude toward the Cold War and toward fighting against Eastern Russian and Chinese communism, I guess you could, um, you could probably also say that um, uh, this um, this attitude that rose up in opposition to this made the, uh, made the argument that the West uh, was facing a revolt of the third world against colonialism. Um, that is um, um, probably the, um, I, I don't know how to put it, that that's the most important aspect of the period 
what you might normally think of as the Cold War. So I haven't put that idea very well. I kind of wandered into that idea. Let me try to articulate that a little better. Um, alongside the idea uh, that um, the um, relation of the West to the East is a matter of defending against communism instead of supporting the third world rising up against capitalism, Western capitalism. That would be the perspective of the Cold Warrior and the idea that is coherent with McNeil. Instead of that, we get a perspective that uh, the struggle against communism is just an excuse in a way, but the real thing that's going on in the Cold War is the revolt of the subject peoples, non-European peoples, non-Western peoples against this world system, capitalist world system, uh, seeking their independence, and seeking a struggle against uh, colonialism and imperialism. So left and right, in a certain sense, in Cold War terms. Um, anyhow, that's the, uh, that's the perspective that emerges with, um, uh, with Stavrianos, with, um, Wallerstein with world systems theory and the rest of that. What goes along with that are some very interesting subsidiary studies about the way we look at other aspects of the Western tradition. Um, say it's revolutionary uh, aspects. I don't see how you can write about the Western tradition unless you write about the kind of revolutionary things that go on in the West. The big revolts, in, in effect, uh, the revolt of humanism during the Renaissance, you could say. Um, the Certainly the English Revolution of the 17th century, certainly the French and American revolutions of the 18th century. And you might even go a step further and say the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Iranian Revolution. Um, so at any rate, there's a kind of revolutionary element in Western civilization that doesn't get as much play as the other uh, description of the origins of Western institutions, but there is this great struggle going on, and it's a struggle for enlightenment. That's what it amounts to, a struggle for enlightenment. It's against the church much, most of the time, Catholic church, Latin church, uh, but then it's also against other elites in Europe, and it represents all sorts of emancipatory notions, democracy, socialism, anarchism, oh, no, no, all sorts of things, uh, radical. Uh, well, some of them not so radical, some of them just liberal, but radical as well. Um, but in, is this a revolt that goes on strictly with white men? And that's the way it might have been taught. If you read books like The Age of Democratic Revolution, uh, written by R. R. Palmer, great historian of the French Revolution, the best in many ways. Um, well, in, all, in some ways. Uh, of the um, of the French Revolution, uh, it's a revolt um, in, that goes on in the Atlantic for the most part. It's American colonists, it's people in Europe. The Swiss are involved in it. it uses the language for the most part of the English Revolution of the 17th century. This is the revolution that develops into the French and American revolutions and et cetera, all the related revolutions. And we're also going to talk about the Latin American uh, liberation from Spanish colonial rule and all the rest of that, all these revolutions. Um, but do we properly take into consideration the revolt of the slaves who did not get their full emancipation in this revolutionary Atlantic revolution we're talking about? They certainly didn't in the United States. In fact, you could make the argument the southern states joined the revolution. I'm not the first person to say this, that the southern American states joined the revolution because they were afraid the British were going to abolish slavery. So have we talked about the revolt of the slaves, the position of the slaves, the centrality in a certain sense of the slaves and all our discussion about the world history of this period, and in this case, about the revolutionary aspects of the world. And by revolutionary, I mean those aspects of a particular historical epoch and that seem to point to the next historical epoch that don't seem to be satisfied uh, with the era they live in, but want to go on to the next phase. That's what I mean when I say revolutionary. Um, 
So how about the slave revolt that took place in Haiti, um, inspired by Jacobinism? So here, here you have Toussaint Louverture, who led this revolt uh, at the turn of the 19th century under the influence of Jacobinism in the French Revolution. Jacobinism, the most radical democratic um, line in the French Revolution. Um, unsuccessful, but his successors turned out to be more successful than he, and they ended up getting independence for Haiti. I'm not sure it turned out so well for Haiti uh, because of the terrible things that the French did in reprisal. Nevertheless, it's a very important revolutionary influence. It probably is the reason that the United States got control of the territory given us by Napoleon in the Louisiana Purchase uh, on account of the destruction of the economic influence of New Orleans in the sugar, sugar trade because of this revolt of the black slaves in Haiti. So it has a big impact on our history, which we don't hear much about. Um, of course, we don't hear much about the black slaves in the United States either in world history. Uh, at any rate, the hitherto written world, world, world history up to the point we're talking about. So um, this created a big stir in the 60s, and the book's written by a former Trotskyist, C.L.R. James, a uh, brilliant guy, fantastic, fantastic speaker and writer, and a very influential person, influential book. Um, some newer versions of it um, have appeared since, since then, but they all pretty much tread the same path that this book treads in recognizing the importance of the Haitian uh, Revolution. Uh, to the whole period we're talking about. So let me see, what are we doing? We're going backwards. Let's go forwards. Um, there's a quote from James about property and privilege, how, how you always see them in history, but you don't always see them coming to the fore. A lot of revolutionaries make the idea the masses create history. This seems to argue the other way around, that they seem to seem to create it, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a momentary passion soon appeased, to be sure, but other passions emerge in its, uh, in its wake. Okay, so this is a kind of an argument we're, we're describing here for broadening the notion of Western civilization um, and including revolutionary elements in Western civilization. What, what have we said for the third world itself? I mean, what are we saying? Have we, are, are we saying that history up to this point has been too Eurocentric? Okay, all of you have heard this phrase, Eurocentric, and you've all heard people accused of being too Eurocentric. It's not a good thing to be Eurocentric, presumably, or most of us, uh, most of us at least contemplate the idea that maybe everything in history, our reading of history has been too Eurocentric up to this point. Okay, but a lot of people that we've been talking about, Stavrianos and Wallerstein and the others, maybe to some degree, Andre Gunder Frank to some degree, some others. Um, yeah, they have been saying something like this. But the guy who has really put it as strongly as possible, fierce polemicist, huge influence on the thinking of all of the other world historians, was not a his world historian himself at all. Uh, but um, but a, a geographer. Actually, I knew this guy, James Blount. I knew him and I talked with him about the very things that we're talking about. And you can see his work in um, probably his most famous book, although a little later book uh, also did a bit, very big sales, uh, Eight Eurocentric Historians. It's about a lot of historians he wants to debunk uh, because they put Europe too much at the center of things. And this is called the colonizer's model of the world in which he pretty much lays the argument out. What's the date for that? 1993. Uh, it's very typical of the 90s. The 90s are a period in which uh, world historians pop up at the universities, start getting positions. They have a journal in Hawaii, Jerry Bentley, um, the editor of this journal, Journal of World History, a lot of sophisticated writing about world history. A lot of it is still around today and uh, very influential and good stuff, in my opinion, very worthy stuff for historians to know about. Um, some, histories, some historians in our department are very much uh, influenced and conversant with this, 
material and you know give papers at conferences and that sort of thing um, uh, to keep up with what's being argued among these. Uh, I think maybe you could say the most sophisticated world historians of our of our time. And but they all owe something, in my opinion, to Blout. And maybe Blout puts it more polemically, more cruelly, cruelly <laughs> than uh, other historians would. That the other historians are all wet. Uh, that, you know, their attitudes toward history is terrible, Eurocentric, very much a term of uh, opprobrium uh, for Blout. And what Blout argues for our purposes, you know, naturally, in our this rapid uh, survey that we're making, I, you know, we can't do any of these people justice because they were all written huge, huge works of world history. But his argument pretty much is that the West looks like it conquered the world because of its own wonderfulness. That is to say, because of its development of superior qualities, cultural, etc., which in the end developed into the possibility of diffusing its culture to the rest of the world uh, through conquest, and etc. But he says uh, the real point is that um, the West is only more important than other places in the world or had a temporary, that's the other thing we should say, had a temporary superiority, um, which is coming to an end now, but a temporary superiority uh, because it conquered the New World and the New World, the Americas, is where it got gold and silver. And that's the whole point. And then the gold and silver comes into Europe and between 1500 and 1650, uh, they have a price inflation of about 150%. That doesn't impress us much today with the depreciation of the dollar, but for those days, very big deal. The, the introduction of gold and silver uh, from the, the mines in Mexico and Peru has this huge influence uh, over over the West and very very stimulative for the Western Western economy. Uh, and he says uh, the West was not ahead of anybody at that time. Uh, that this is just an accident of history. The Chinese were had a big navy at that time. Admiral Zheng He. Um, took this navy uh, out of China and took an expedition to Africa. Yeah, he brought back a giraffe and um, showed it to the Chinese at court, etc. In other words, the Chinese had all the capacities to be able to do the same thing, to go all the way around Africa and to head up. Well, I'm not doing a very good job of their voyage. I have their voyage going to the Sahara here. Um, and to head up into the New World and to conquer, let's see if I can make them, there we go, <laughs> conquer the new world. So the Chinese could have done it, he says, except for the winds, the winds at the Cape. Uh, they do not favor uh, travelers um, uh, going westward, but they do favor travelers going eastward, Vasco da Gama and, and, and uh, Magellan and, uh, and the others going eastward. And so that's the only reason, he says, this is, I think, his central argument. That's the only reason Blout says that uh, the West turned out to be so wonderful, because up to that point, the Chinese are way ahead in every possible respect. Um, they're really the center of civilization, despite everything, until well into the 19th century. This is true. Um, so it's all a big accident. The... Uh, the triumph of Western civilization. It's just an accident. It has to do with the winds uh, around the Cape. So that pretty much is the way Blout put it. Uh, most influenced by Blout was André Gunder Frank, who was one of these world systems theorists and already had a big reputation. Uh, but then he published his most powerful book, Reorient the Global Economy in the Asian Age, in which he makes Blout's arguments um, in a way that even Blout didn't make, make them. So very, very powerful statement, learned, learned, powerful, polemical, polemical stay arguing like mad uh, with everybody who disagrees, um, denouncing your Euro Eurocentrism and saying that um, even Marx, denouncing Marx um, and for not recognizing the importance of the East and China, for being too Eurocentric, everybody too Eurocentric. And the big map for him, and once again, I don't do him justice. 
but the big map for him is this one, which gives an indication of all the routes along which gold and silver found their way. And this is very laborious and kind of, what's the word, granular. Uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this way in which various kinds of <laughs> vessels <laughs> managed to get gold and silver to China. And, you know, it's not something, you know, we're not talking about a huge constant traffic, but a, a, accumulation over a period of time and over a couple of centuries, China ends up as the silver sink. That is to say, the place where the precious metals are. And it's rightly so because Chinese products are the best in the world. So you could argue that there's a world economy going on right now, world capitalism. So this is before the Industrial Revolution. World capitalism in the center of the world economy is China. And, in, and it shows because the Chinese are collecting precious metals. Precious metals being the whole, the whole point. And that is... Uh, that is argument. That is his argument. And then he says that imperialism, therefore, it represents a little gap in this tendency. Um, for a while, it seems as if China is weak and the West is great. The imperial nations rise up at the end of the 19th century, really. Not, not even in the 18th, in the 19th century and in the 20th. And they really have got a heyday of about 100 years. I mean, roughly speaking, from about, really roughly speaking, from about 1850 to 1950. That's the heyday of Western imperialism. Otherwise, it's um, pretty much a story of the rise of China. That is to say, the whole story of world history is pretty much a story, he argues, Gunter Frank, of the rise of, uh, the rise of China. So the argument against imperialism, and it's based on this notion that there is such a thing, and I think it's highly questionable myself, that there's such a thing as a world economy in the 17th, 18th. I don't think you can say that. Uh, but if you looked at it entirely in terms of trade, and no matter how paltry this trade is, and even if this trade does not represent, you know, a portion, you know, various countries do engage in this trade, uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, what percentage of their total product is, does this represent? Maybe it's not very big. So I don't know that it's the argument that this is a functioning world system so far back, a globalization, if you want to think of it that way, signified globalization so far back. I think that's highly questionable. At any rate, whether we question it or not, this is the argument. And bear in mind that a lot of this is ideology, not just science. A lot of it is ideology. It makes people's hearts beat faster and and it animates passions. So we have to take into account of it, whether it's science or ideology. We have to, both of those things function in history. So at any rate, there we are. And I think the tendency continues. So uh, Jeanette Abu Lugad, um, she writes against Euro uh, Eurocentrism and makes the argument in her book, Before European Hegemony, uh, that um, maybe we don't pay enough attention to the era before Columbus, and that if we did, uh, we wouldn't uh, think the Europeans were so important. And certainly before Columbus, they were not important, she says. Other peoples were important. Her book, Before European Hegemony, uh, deals with the 13th and 14th centuries. Those are the Mongol, the Mongol centuries uh, in terms of the world island. And she says, uh, consider these important uh, empires. She hasn't considered the Mongols at all. Uh, in this, um, at any anyway, rate, this does not demonstrate the Mongols. Um, I can't blame this on her. Uh, but uh, we have here the famous gunpowder empires that many of the world historians talk about. So there's the Ottoman Empire, this uh, Safavid Persia, a Mughal Empire in, in uh, India. So Mughal uh, is there a way of saying Mongol, and it has to do with Mongol influence in India. And the, um, the Qing Empire, the Manchu Empire, uh, that runs from 1644 to 1911 um, in, uh, in China. And then, of course, there's the Russians. And they're still with us, pretty much in this shape, as you can see. So the argument is made, and you will run into this argument uh, in world history courses. The argument is made that uh, these were very important states, and this was kind of a world power system, if you will, uh, before Columbus, and, and not a 
system of European domination of anything. Uh, but, but these Europeans, by the way, they're also a gunpowder empire in this period. They have the same technology as these other countries, same guns for the most part, even during this early period. So they are kind of a, end up being a gunpowder empire. Not a, not a big one though, I, I'll, I'll go along with their argument. Um, and there they are. Uh, but can you call this a world system? Is this a globalization? I don't think so. She thinks so. She kicks around this idea, which is, uh, has a big impact on a lot of minds, that these various empires, they had the trading systems. And of course, it's not one trading system. It's a series of trading systems that are connected in some way to each other, but not to all of the, all of the others. So it isn't one system. And moreover, um, this map of uh, these uh, gunpowder empires, they, they didn't fight wars with one another. I mean, they, there are some skirmishes between the Russians and the Qing Empire, uh, that I admit. Uh, not exactly full-scale wars. And for the most part, these countries do not war upon one another. There is not, they're not part of a system in which all of them have to take sides if there's a war. It isn't a system in which there's a balance of power or any of that stuff. <clears throat> not in the slightest way comparable uh, to the European states. Uh, in terms of their wars and their balances and the rest of that. So I don't know that you could say this is a world system, except in the mind of the, of the world historian. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the trading systems, they are related one to another. Maybe you could start to make that argument that there's a world system around these various trade. You have to ask how important this trade is to each of the economies, what percentage of it, whether it really constitutes as big a thing as you're making out of it as fascinating as it is, not to take anything away from the brilliant work of Janet Abu Lugod. Uh, great, it's great stuff. But um, I wonder how far we can take this idea. And of course, it's very suggestive to us because uh, there we have what the Chinese are trying to organize right now with their Silk Road project. They're very conscious of all of this historical and cultural background, uh, the things we're talking about very conscious of these things and they theorize about them in very similar ways to much of the world historian uh, community. But we have a lot of other works like this. We have Marshall Hodgson in his book, The Venture of Islam in 1974. And then there he makes makes the argument pretty much that Islam was, uh, has been trying to be a world system, to be sure, to be sure, trying to be a world system and uh, has many aspects of a world system. And uh, that pretension still exists, even in our day. So you know, think about Islam, he thinks, uh, and its persistence. He's got a point there. Um, and then Ken Pomerantz uh, um, talking about, once again, the accidental nature, in a certain sense, of the, um, the West being ahead. The British are ahead because they've got coal, and uh, you know this whole coal thing didn't quite shape up in the East the way it did for the British. And this one is sort of an accident of coal that puts the British ahead. So Pomerantz's work, also very sophisticated stuff, detailed, to which I'm not doing justice uh, in this discussion. And Arbin Wong, who argues similarly. A lot of these people taught at colleges in California. Sometimes people call them the California school. Uh, so they back up a lot of the things. It's a, it is a general trend among world historians to make these arguments. Um, you have to say arguments against Eurocentrism, uh, summing them up. So what have we got at the end of it? Two large ideas. The, um, the persistence of Islam and I guess the rise of China. Um, uh, but do they pay enough attention, I would argue, in all of this discussion, to the sea? Are they a little bit, how to put it, um, do they give short shrift to the sea, to the discovery of navigation, to the intellectual revolution that creates science? Who's the leader in science in the world? I think it's the West. Is that the reason why the West is dominant at sea? Did the scientific revolution of the 17th century provide for a 
European navigation superiority, which created the European navies that dominated, con conquered the world and diffused, I guess you'd have to say, Western culture to the world, at least for a while, under imperialism, and which still has, has influence today. And uh, who are the powerful navies today? What's the role of navies in history? Of course, these are interesting things. And I don't know that they're given proper attention uh, by the people we've been, we've been talking about. And I guess one last question, um, and this goes back to the first question we raised, the dollar. Why is the dollar so important? Why is the world organized around the dollar? Um, does this have anything to do with economy? Is this a question of economic history? <clears throat> or is it just a question of the U.S. hegemony in the world? I would answer the question by emphasizing the latter, the U.S. hegemony in the world. That's the reason, the power of the dollar. And maybe that tips us off to what might be called, I don't think anybody does call, this, call it this, but what might be called the um, hegemony theory of money, theory that if you want to know why a certain economy runs the world system, um, maybe the whole answer doesn't lie in asking whether their products are superior to all the other products. Uh, maybe the right question is to ask is, who's more powerful and who, who tells the others what to do? As the Russians say, Kotokovo. who does it to whom? Who is the initiator of the action? Who is the receiver of the action? Who is the subject and who is the object? Maybe the Eurocentric historians, maybe they take this into account more. Well, at any rate, if they did, it would be to their credit, in my opinion. Okay, so let me finish this whole thing up, and I will close things. We'll just have you look at a graph. Uh, it gives you an indication of the superiority of the United States, this graph, but it also tells you about China having once been greatest economy way ahead of everybody until very late in the game, um, how it's humbled and how it comes right back under the communists to the point where it emerges as the leading economy in the world in our day. So this diagram, which gives you a bar for the US, China, India, United Kingdom, Germany, if you look closely, Russia, France, Italy, Japan, I guess you don't have to pay so much attention to the others, but uh, look at those um, major powers contending, and look at the people who've been on top. So this diagram, which I will run with only a little bit of commentary, it covers the whole period, we'll finish up with this, and it covers the whole period um, um, from 1600, I believe I've got that right, 1600. So let's run it, and I'll see if I can make some commentary. I'll cut out the sound, so we have, we have dramatic music throughout throughout this thing. Let's see, from 1800, sorry, not 1600. So, what do we have here? China, way ahead of everybody. India, way ahead of everybody. The European powers, so this is the era of the Napoleonic Wars. The European imperial powers are way, way behind. <coughs> the leading economy of the world is China. Is the Easternization, if you will, of the world. Coming up into the period past the Industrial Revolution. So the British are moving a little bit because of their Industrial Revolution. But even that doesn't change the fundamental equation. The British have, of course, got control of India, but it's the Indian economy which is marching ahead uh, so fabulously. Well, that's what's producing all the wealth for those big houses in Britain uh, that the big aristocrats uh, sit, the places we go to visit today. Uh, they get it from India, as Edward Said has re reminded us. And of course, the British, look, they're advancing very dramatically in European, by European standards, but by world standards, Nobody's anywhere near China, or India, for that matter. Just in terms of, if you looked at it in terms of a world economy, 
that is to say, what one could think of the whole world united in one economy. I'm not even sure this makes sense uh, for 1860, but let's go along with the idea. And then we're into the period of the American Industrial Revolution. So you'll start to see America spurt ahead from this point on. America is going to be a real force and competing with the British, as you can see. And the others striving to keep up with those two. The Germans driving and the French driving along with the Germans. The United States racing ahead of everybody at the end of the 19th century. Racing up to the point where they're going to eclipse China by about 1890. The appearance of Mahan's book on the influence of sea power on history, I might note, 1890. Now the United States is the leading power in the world. And even China is falling back. India is falling back. China's going to fall back a lot. In fact, everybody falls back before the United States. And this is during the heyday of European expansionism, bear in mind. Now, the United States has this kind of superiority. Then we come up into World War I. But World War I is going to be, reduce everybody's ability to keep up with the United States. The United States forging ahead dramatically, re relatively speaking, forging ahead dramatically during World War I and the period afterward. And uh, now we're coming into the period of the, the Great Depression. And in the Great Depression, the United States still has the upper hand. It's going to be even more so in World War II. See everybody falling back. The United States racing on, dominant, hegemonic figure. The Germans, of course, drop out of the equation. Russia, not here shown with the hammer and sickle, but in a post-Soviet flag, but that's uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, is the only real competitor in the Cold War with the United States. And even Russia has a hard time keeping up with the United States. But it's not as if Russia can't surpass all the others. It's just that it can't, the United States has too much of a lead, too much of a lead. Now we're going to see Japan moving up, starting to sell its automobiles in the United States, starting to demonstrate, demonstrate how to trade with the United States and gain some national advantage thereby. In fact, you might even start to think that Russia once it starts to decline after the fall of communism, fall of communism is going to reduce Russia terribly. Watch Russia disappear. Okay, there goes communism. Right about now, watch Russia disappear. Yeah, sinks back into the back, below germ, below everybody. And the Japanese forge ahead. So the argument is made during the 90s that Japan's the country of the future. Famous book about it by a guy named Vogel makes this argument. China takes in Japan takes up in Japan's stead, pursuing the Japan ideas, but in, in a communist way. And here they come in the 21st century. And there goes the United States in our time. And now they progress, or uh, project, excuse me, into the future. So there we have it. Next time, let's uh, talk about the British in the 19th century, uh, uh, the historian's idea of the model uh, for the present globalization and globalization, one uh, English historian uh, puts it. Let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about that next time.